What do a werewolf, a vampire, and a 12-year-old girl have in common? All these elements are connected to the murder of two loving parents and their eight-year-old son. Sunday, April 23, 2006, was a clear but frosty morning in Madison Head, Alberta, Canada. Despite it being mid-spring, Garrett decided it was the perfect time to visit his friend across the street. He hoped they could play on the quiet street where their houses stood, as they had been doing since the end of winter. The boy Garrett was visiting was his eight-year-old friend, Tyler Richardson. The Richardson family, Deborah, Mark, Tyler, and their 12-year-old daughter, Jasmine, lived in a well-kept gray house with a gabled roof and a manicured lawn, an ideal picture of a middle-class family. But on this spring day, what lay before their house was far from perfect. As Garrett approached the house, he noticed that the blinds were still closed, and when he knocked, no one answered. It was Sunday, and the family usually returned from church by this time. The car was parked in the driveway, so they were home. Garrett peered through the living room window but saw no movement. He decided to go to the basement where he and Tyler sometimes played. As Garrett looked through the basement window in the bright streetlight, his eyes took a moment to adjust to the darkness. Garrett saw what he thought were the outlines of two bodies lying motionless and covered in blood on the floor. He hurried home to tell his mother what he thought he had seen. The woman was shocked and doubted whether what he said was true, as her son was known to embellish details. She took her son by the hand, and they crossed the street together. Garrett led his mother to the basement window he had looked through. The woman also saw two bloody bodies, and immediately called the police. What the investigators discovered inside the Richardson house shocked both the police and the public, sparking discussions for many years. The police arrived, and forced open the front door of the eerily empty Richardson house. They called out, but no one answered, so they went downstairs to where Garrett and his mother had allegedly seen the bodies. As the officers entered the gloomy basement, they saw two blood-soaked adults lying on the floor with glassy eyes, clearly dead. Blood was everywhere, on the floor, the ceiling, and the walls. Despite their injuries, the deceased were identified as Mark and Deborah Richardson. The couple had been brutally murdered in their own basement, but their bodies were not the only thing that startled the officers that day. Upstairs, in one of the bedrooms, they found the remains of the eight-year-old Tyler, also covered in blood, just like his parents. He had a deep wound across his throat, extending from ear to ear. By then, the police had searched the rest of the house and realized something was missing. Family photos of the Richardsons adorned the walls and mantel, showing a family of four. It became evident that the eldest child, Jasmine, was neither dead nor alive. She was missing. Since the rest of the family had been killed, the police were worried about her well-being. Her room was in perfect order, with everything in its place. Outside her room in the area where the bodies were found, there were no obvious signs of a struggle. The family car was still in the driveway, indicating that the criminals had their own transportation. Given that the bodies were already cold and the blood was thick and coagulated, it seemed the Richardson family had been killed the night before. Officers assumed that one or more persons had entered the house and killed Tyler, Deborah, and Mark. But what about Jasmine? Where had she gone? Was she kidnapped? or was she far from home and accidentally escaped the murder? These questions remained unanswered. Just hours after discovering the Richardson family's bodies, authorities issued statements through the media expressing grave concern for Jasmine's safety and urging anyone with information about her whereabouts to come forward. While the police awaited news about Jasmine, investigations began. Every aspect of the Richardson's lives leading up to the crime was scrutinized, Family, friends, colleagues, and acquaintances were questioned, anyone who might have had a motive or harbored anger towards the family, but nothing was resolved. It seemed the Richardsons were exactly who they appeared to be, a close-knit and loving family, with the exception of one family member, the eldest child, Jasmine. The day after the crime, the tone of the police statements regarding Jasmine changed dramatically. Instead of worrying about her welfare, the police now sought to locate a person connected to the murder case. 
Not many details were disclosed, but reading between the lines, it was clear that Jasmine had become the prime suspect in the murder of her family. Under Canadian law, this meant the media could no longer mention Jasmine by name due to her age. They began referring to her simply as J.R., obscuring her identity. By 2006, Jasmine had grown up as a bright and caring girl. She attended a local Catholic school, where she was an excellent student, encouraged by her parents to pursue her passions both in and out of school. She was quite shy and quiet, spending much of her time with her family and close friends. But as Jasmine grew older, everything began to change. Firstly, her appearance transformed. She looked much older than her age due to her premature curves. The sweet photos she had once posted on social media with kittens or flowers vanished. In their place were images of a girl with heavy black eyeliner, wearing dark, torn clothing. Her taste in music changed from the pop she loved as a child to aggressive heavy metal. Around this time, Jasmine started identifying as gothic, drifting away from her friend group. When she got her own computer, she subscribed to various gothic-themed websites. Jasmine's profile featured a fictitious name and an exaggerated age. The slogan on her profile read, Welcome to my tragic world. She described herself as a witch preaching the Wicca religion, nocturnal and crazy, with a love for dark poetry, criminal psychology, blood, and human anatomy. Jasmine interacted on these sites with others who belonged to the same Gothic community. Gradually, Jasmine began communicating with older men, many of whom were much older than she was. At home, she became sullen and withdrawn, losing interest in spending time with her family or usual friends. She spent hours locked in her bedroom, surfing the internet and chatting with strangers. Her clothing became increasingly provocative. Her parents, of course, loved their daughter and did not always forbid everything, but relied on her judgment and understanding that she was growing up and many things were changing in her life. Therefore, they did not object when Jasmine asked to attend a local punk rock concert in early 2006. At this concert, her path crossed with Jeremy Steinke. Jeremy was a 23-year-old man who, like Jasmine, was interested in the punk and gothic scene. They started talking, began communicating over the internet, and Jeremy asked Jasmine to be his girlfriend. Jasmine, crazy about the guy, immediately agreed. Jeremy lived in a trailer, had not completed high school, and his mother was an alcoholic who had had various partners over the years who had all mistreated Jeremy as a child. At the age of 13, he had significant troubles at school, was bullied by older boys, and was diagnosed with depression and hyperactivity after his first suicide attempt. But it wasn't his turbulent childhood that was the worst thing about Jeremy. Ten years before meeting Jasmine, Jeremy had transformed into a 300-year-old werewolf, claiming to be immortal and craving the taste of blood. He always carried a vial of blood around his neck, although it was unclear whether it was human or animal blood. Like Jasmine, Jeremy wore dark, torn clothing and listened to gothic music. It was this strange and unusual personality that attracted Jasmine. She wanted to feel older and more mature, and being with Jeremy gave her that feeling. The fact that their intimate relationship was taboo made it even more enticing. Jasmine and Jeremy knew from the start that the Richardson parents would never approve of their relationship, so they devised ways to keep their romance a secret. In a time when mobile phones were not as common as they are today, and landlines were not an option for fear that parents might find out, the couple used a gothic community website to stay in touch. Jeremy already had an online profile that featured themes of pain, self-harm, blood, and razor blades. Within weeks, they were corresponding on the website, arranging meetings, and no one knew about their relationship, except for friends who found it odd. To Jasmine's distress and embarrassment, her parents began monitoring her online activities. When they discovered their 12-year-old daughter was having increasingly disturbing conversations with random strangers on the internet, they punished her and took away her computer. When her parents asked who Soul Eater was, Jasmine eventually confessed and told them everything about her boyfriend. Deborah and Mark were horrified to learn that Jeremy was 23 years old. Like any other parents, they were concerned that this man was taking advantage of their daughter. Although they had never met him, 
they knew nothing good would come of this relationship. The parents forbade their daughter from any contact with Jeremy and enrolled her and themselves in family psychological counseling, hoping to make Jasmine understand that Jeremy was not the right person for her. To their relief, after several consultations, Jasmine showed signs of returning to her normal state. When Jasmine sincerely promised not to communicate with men on the internet anymore and not to see Jeremy, her parents agreed to return her computer. This decision proved fateful, as they were found dead a few days later. Jasmine was missing and involved in the grisly, brutal murders. It wasn't until the truth about Jasmine and Jeremy's relationship came to light that the police began a frantic search. They called all her friends, hoping that she had escaped the attacker who killed her parents and was staying with someone she trusted. However, friends reported seeing Jasmine only hours after her parents' death and said she seemed neither shocked nor panicked. She was in good spirits. Jasmine and Jeremy showed up at a friend's house party, and one of the friends present said Jasmine had bragged that she and her boyfriend had killed her parents, and Jeremy added that he had gutted them like fish. Friends thought the couple was joking, but the joke was gruesome. It was only the next day when the police questioned acquaintances and friends that they realized these bragging words were true. The couple had attended the party after killing Jasmine's entire family. The police questioned Jasmine's classmates and teachers and searched her school locker, where they found a drawing of a stick figure girl setting her parents' house on fire and driving away with her boyfriend. With this information, the tone of police statements in the media changed again. The search for Jasmine had turned into a manhunt for both Jasmine and Jeremy, now suspects in the brutal murders of two adults and an eight-year-old boy. By this time, Jeremy and Jasmine had had enough time to flee, and the police released their photos, hoping a tip would lead to their location. Public appeals by the authorities worked, and the next day, the couple was spotted 130 kilometers from the Richardson home. Investigators went to the address and found the sweet couple kissing under a blanket in a parked pickup truck. Both were arrested without resistance and brought in for questioning. By then, the autopsy results were in, and the causes of death for the three victims were clear. The attack was brutal. Deborah died first. She had multiple stab wounds all over her body, the deepest penetrating her chest by 12 centimeters and reaching her heart. Jasmine's mother bled to death in the basement. Mark was next. He had 24 wounds on his back and also bled to death in the basement, just a few meters from his dying wife. The youngest Richardson, Tyler, was the last to go. He was in his room wearing pajamas when he was stabbed five times, including a deep cut across his throat. After Jeremy and Jasmine were arrested, investigators questioned them separately. Jasmine admitted during her interrogation that she was very unhappy after her parents tried to separate her from Jeremy. She claimed he was the love of her life and her parents wanted to break them apart. Jasmine told the police she came home and found her entire family murdered but she was not at home at the time of the crime. She knew Jeremy was responsible because he said he would do it. Jasmine believed that killing her family was the ultimate expression of her boyfriend's love, and she loved him so much that she was willing to cover for him and run away with him. Jasmine denied any involvement in the murders, but Jeremy had a different story to tell. While in custody, an undercover officer posing as a prisoner was placed in his cell. In conversations with the prisoner, Jeremy openly declared that the plan to kill Jasmine's family was entirely her idea. At first, he was unhappy with the plan, but when Jasmine's parents took her computer away and insisted they couldn't see each other, Jeremy realized they had to go and agreed to participate in her plan to kill the entire family. Jeremy admitted to killing Deborah and Mark, but placed the blame for Tyler's murder solely on Jasmine. She had begged him to do it, although Jeremy would have liked to finish them all himself. During the investigation of this case, the police needed to know who was responsible for planning the murders, and thanks to Jeremy's conversation with the undercover officer, which was secretly recorded, everything became clear. When Jasmine was told how everything had really happened, she had no choice but to confess. She said she was the one who had stabbed and killed her brother, but the reason was that she did not want to leave him as an orphan. 
The police also had to read the internet profiles of each defendant, review their chats, and find out that the couple had exchanged thousands of messages in the few weeks since they met. In these messages was confirmation that Jasmine had devised the entire plan, which Jeremy supported, encouraging him to be more creative and pay attention to details. Jeremy wrote Jasmine a message saying, I miss you more than killing people. We can be together and kill them. And when her computer was taken away, he wrote, I dream of the day I can slit their throats. They will pay for their insolence, and there will finally be silence. Their blood will be the payment. The couple also discussed a time when the family would be dead, and they could flee and be together and independent. Interestingly, Jeremy was not the only one Jasmine encouraged to kill. More friends reported that Jasmine had talked about killing her parents on more than one occasion, but they had dismissed it as rebellious talk. No one could have imagined that the once sweet and friendly Jasmine would be capable of such horror. With sufficient evidence that Jasmine had conspired to kill her parents and brother, and that Jeremy was responsible for the deaths of Deborah and Mark, both were charged with triple homicide. During their interrogations and imprisonment, the couple showed neither remorse nor regret for the crime they had committed. They wrote letters to each other from their separate cells, calling themselves legends and immortals. In one letter, Jeremy asked Jasmine to marry him, and she enthusiastically agreed. After the charges were filed, authorities wanted to know exactly how the murders had occurred that night. Jeremy said he had been inspired by the movie Natural Born Killers, in which a couple kills nine people, calling it a love story. He said he and Jasmine had decided to be like the couple in the film, and had planned the attack. Jeremy drank alcohol before putting on his mask. Jasmine led him into the Richardson house and directly to the basement. Deborah woke up from the noise and came to check. Jeremy hid and waited, then stabbed her multiple times. She fought desperately and screamed in pain and fear. Mark ran downstairs and tried to stop the attack to protect his wife, waving a screwdriver at Jeremy, but couldn't land a single blow. Jeremy was relentless and did not stop until he had stabbed Mark 24 times from both the front and back. Meanwhile, Jasmine went upstairs and stabbed her little brother in his bed. When Jeremy finished with the parents, he went upstairs to find Jasmine with her brother. Jeremy helped his girlfriend by slitting the younger Richardson's throat. After these savage events, Jeremy went home to wash off the blood, while Jasmine took a taxi to the restaurant where they met later. They then went to a friend's party to celebrate the deaths of Jasmine's family before being picked up by a friend and taken to Saskatchewan, where the couple was found and arrested. In June 2007, just a year after the murders, Jasmine was tried on three counts of first-degree murder. She pleaded not guilty in court, claiming she was in a zombie-like state when Jeremy killed her parents. She said her discussions about killing her parents were hypothetical and that Jeremy had pressured her to turn the idea into a real plan. When asked about her brother, she replied that she remembered him begging for his life and remembered wounding him, but claimed it was Jeremy who killed him. When asked why she had planned to kill her family, Jasmine said, I loved him so much, I thought it would bring us closer together. Jasmine Richardson was found guilty on all counts and, under Canadian youth law, was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Persons under 14 cannot be sentenced to more than 10 years in prison. Jasmine's sentence focused primarily on her rehabilitation rather than incarceration, including a four-year stay in a psychiatric facility where she was diagnosed with conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder. Conduct disorder is usually diagnosed in children and is characterized by a lack of respect for others, often leading to hostile and violent behavior. Oppositional defiant disorder starts in childhood and manifests in children who are uncooperative, defiant, and hostile toward authority figures, particularly their parents. During her final years of imprisonment, Jasmine was placed under community supervision and attended special courses. In 2008, Jeremy's trial began for three counts of first-degree murder. His defense sought to reduce the charges to manslaughter, arguing that Jeremy was under the influence of illegal substances at the time and had lost control. They also blamed Jasmine, 
who had already been found guilty, arguing that she had seduced their client to commit murder and that he was in love and willing to do anything for her. Some of Jeremy's friends claimed he had asked them to help kill Mark and Deborah, or Jasmine would tear him apart if he didn't do it. Jeremy claimed that Jasmine had killed her brother herself, and he had just watched from the door. He also said he hadn't planned to kill her parents, but was waiting in the basement for Jasmine to come down. Deborah's arrival surprised him, and he had to attack. However, he contradicted himself when asked why he had killed the Richardsons. He said, when you find your soulmate, you do whatever they want. Throughout the trial, Jeremy remained indifferent and composed, except when his mother, Jacqueline May, testified to his defense. Jacqueline, suffering from an incurable lung disease, recounted how her son had problems as a child because he was mistreated by her various partners. She remembered him being beaten with a belt and stick and pulled by the ears. Jeremy cried during his mother's testimony. She was the only person called to Jeremy's defense. The words of his mother and Jeremy's brief emotional outburst were not enough to justify him. He was found guilty of three counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to three life terms in prison. He would not be eligible for parole for 25 years. During his imprisonment, he changed his name to Jackson May. One of the couple's friends, Casey Lancaster, was charged with accessory to murder for driving the couple away from the crime scene and helping dispose of evidence. The crimes shocked Canada, given the age and brutality with which the family was killed. In 2016, Jasmine was released after serving her full sentence with no further conditions. The judge declared her absolute freedom and told Jasmine, I think your parents and brother would be proud of you. Of course, the past cannot be changed, but now she lives with the knowledge that she can control her behavior. Jasmine Richardson lives in Canada without disclosing her whereabouts. Due to her age at the time of the crime, her name still cannot be published. She remains the youngest convicted multiple murderer in Canadian history. Jasmine has never expressed remorse for the murder of her family and has not apologized. This crime has sparked significant interest since Jasmine's conviction, with her story being featured in various crime and mystery shows. The audience is fascinated, trying to understand how Jasmine transformed from a naive, sweet girl into a deranged killer. The combination of a self-proclaimed vampire, a werewolf, and a gothic teenager is a recipe for creating the perfect monster. Thank you.